Hey, before we get into today's episode, Brian and I wanted to point you to a great new resource that we created in response to one of the biggest complaints that men have been bringing us over the past year, which is, I cannot compliment a woman anymore in the Me Too era. Without a doubt, gentlemen, these are confusing times when it comes to the new rules of courting and engaging with women, but we want to dispel the myth that you cannot compliment a woman anymore right here, right now. One of our most popular podcasts to date is Four Essential Skills to Complimenting a Woman in the Me Too Era, and we thought that we'd create a simple download that has the four key problems that you're facing with complimenting women in the Me Too Era, and also the four essential skills to complimenting women. So if you go to doinnerwork.com forward slash compliments, doinnerwork.com forward slash compliments, you can get this free PDF download that has the four problems and the four essential skills. And we've also got a bunch of different stories from women as to how they like to be complimented and how they don't like to be complimented. So head on over to doinnerwork.com forward slash compliments. Welcome to the Man Amongst Men podcast. Live a life of intentionality, adventure, and brotherhood. Take the inner journey and live out over your edge constantly. Here are your hosts, Dominic and Brian. Have you ever had a stretch of time in your life where everything just seemed too damn serious? I was going through something like that a few weeks back. Brian was coming over. We were scheduled to record a podcast that wasn't this one. But when he showed up, I was like, dude, I just need to have some fun, blow off some steam. So we're scrapping the plans today. We're playing a little game you probably heard of. It's called 20 Questions. You know the drill. Just stand there and answer the questions. And he looked at me and he goes, okay, I guess this is what we're doing today. And by the end of the recording, it was just what the doctor had ordered, man. We had a bunch of laughs. I learned some stuff about Brian that I'd never known before. So here's the deal, guys. This episode, if you're looking for anything of value or substance, this is not the right episode for you. In fact, if you happen to learn anything of value while we're playing this game, I cannot be held responsible for it. But if you're interested in having a few laughs, maybe escaping from whatever stresses are going on in your lives right now, This is going to be some fun for you. And these questions are ones that you can use on road trips, over beers with friends, uh, even your significant others. Although I might hesitate to ask question number 10, that one you probably don't want to ask your partner. You'll hear that in a moment. And if you enjoy these questions, you can download them at our website, doinnerwork.com forward slash 20 questions, doinnerwork.com forward slash 20 questions. I'll repeat that at the end of the episode. Have some fun. All right, buddy, we've got a conversation today that is going to offer very little nutritional value. (laughs) This is 20 questions with Brian and Dominic. Yeah, if you're looking for a great to do or a great insight or learning, this isn't the podcast. Not your podcast. If you're curious about a little bit about the nuances of who we are and maybe have a few laughs along the way, then here's our 20 questions. And maybe even how we got here. (laughs) Two guys living in New York City talking about dicks and stuff. Here we are. I'm still trying to figure out how the fuck we got here. All right, man, let's kick this thing off. Question number one, something that people are surprised to learn about you is? This one's really simple for me because it's something that people can't typically see, nor is it something that people usually talk about. And let me, any, t- let me, let me guess, let me get me guess. Yeah, if, you, if you've listened to this podcast before, you know what it is, Dominic, go. You have one testicle. I have one testicle. About 10 years ago now, I went through testicular cancer. And when you're diagnosed with testicular cancer, they don't just say, oh, well, let's just cut out a snippet of your testicle or maybe you go through chemotherapy. No, no, no. You immediately, within a day of being diagnosed, lose your testicle. Wow. That's okay. Fast. Really, really quick. Like today you have a testicle. Tomorrow you do not have a testicle. It's very shocking when the doctor told me that. Yeah. I said, well, I said, well, let's pause on this. Like, Like there can be something else. You don't have to take the whole thing out. They said, no, because testicular cancer moves so quickly, they want to get it out of your body very fast. And because if it travels 
up your body. And that's the path of testicular cancers from your testicle to your stomach area, your lymph nodes actually, to your lungs, to your brain. Lance Armstrong had stage four testicular cancer at stage four, not because it's still in his testicle, but because it went through those four stages up to his brain. Oh, fascinating. Okay. So you want to get it out of your system right away. And another fascinating note on testicle, I just figured they'd make a little slit right in my sack and yeah. pull the testicle out. Not how they do it. <laughs> How do they, they do go it? through the top, so they cut through all your abdomen muscles, and they have to pull it out because your testicle is attached to things. We were getting a lot more, a lot deeper on this question than expected. <laughs> yeah, this is question one. Wow, wow. Okay, <laughs> we're gonna wrap up losing a testicle here in five, four. So they pull from the top because your testicle is attached to all these yeah. these veins and everything else, and they want to make sure that the cancer hasn't traveled up that. Holy shit! And so they got to cut it and see if the if the cancer had traveled. So all right, so something people don't usually know about me is I have one testicle. No farewell tour for your testicle. It's gone tomorrow. And also, you've taught me to have much more inclusive language around testicles. So like, grow a pair. You're like about grow one. Right, grow one. Uh, do you have balls? It's like excuse me, I have a ball. Right, right. Okay. I, I like to whenever I write that, I like to put you know B A L L parenthesis s parenthesis so gotcha yeah mine is much simpler something that people are surprised to learn about me is i have never owned a car huh 40 years of my life i've never paid car insurance i've never owned a car grew up i always had my parents car to borrow and then when i graduated college i went to live in philadelphia where i could walk around everywhere and then i've been in new york city ever since so I've never owned a if car. If you were to own a car, what kind of car would you own? I wouldn't even know what to tell you. I know oh. shit about cars. You like, know how to drive. I, I drive quite well. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I've, I've gotten no accidents other than the, my very first night with my license. I got into an accident. Ever since then, no accidents. Okay. So I'm a good driver. Okay. No car. If you're listening to this podcast and you're not in New York City, you're somewhere like LA or the suburbs of Chicago where I grew up, this sounds like, how do you survive? Yeah, but no in way. the city, it's actually easier to survive without a car. Yeah, people outside the city look at me like I have three heads. I'm right. that. All right, man. Your first sexual experience involved... Wow, diving right into the deep end here. I was in high school. I believe this was my freshman year of high school. And up until my freshman year of high school, I had been masturbating, right? Since the age of maybe nine or 10, which we've talked about before. So I had a lot of repetitions, a lot of practice for the seminal moment a lot of, reps. of actually being with another human, human another woman. And <laughs> she I was, was probably a girl, right? She was a girl. Yes. 14, 15 years uh, old. Yeah. I was, in, I was a freshman year in high school. So I was probably 14. Okay. Got yeah. It. 14, 15. I was geared up for this moment. I'm about to get my first blowjob ever. <laughs> Very excited about this. That's a big moment. So excited that I got nervous and couldn't get it up. And that's when she looked at me and said, like, what's wrong with you? Yeah. Which we've, we've, had, we've talked about this story a lot before yeah. on the podcast and venues. But that was the moment where I was like, never again. Never will this thing happen again. I went down this dark path of performance, which we'll talk about in... Many several other, other forums. Several, several, other, several other forums. But <laughs> that was one of my first sexual experiences. My first sexual experience involved Rosie Perez. We know this. You one. know this story too. My very first time ever masturbating by accident, not knowing what I was doing, was watching White Men Can't Jump. And the scene with Rosie Perez, I kept rewinding, fast forwarding, rewinding, fast forwarding until the explosion. And thank you, Rosie. Like I've said before, she has no idea the pivotal role she's She was topless, on. right? That was the... That's it. That That's was all. it, right. Yeah. And I was 13 years old at the time. I didn't even need her topless. Like that would have... <laughs> right? but, but, but that helped. <laughs> all right, man. A failure you still have not gotten over. Whew. Uh, something people probably don't know about me is I applied to be a special agent at the FBI. Yeah, you and did. I made it through this over one year long process, and at the very end, the last step in this process is a polygraph, which I promptly failed. You know what's interesting? You and I have both taken polygraphs. What did you take a polygraph for? Sex addiction. Oh, very, you remember that story? Very different purpose, right? Sex polygraph. addiction, I like you did that. where I was trying to repair my relationship with my girlfriend at the time, and one of the parts of the process is writing up all of the transgressions of that relationship and then having her therapist, my therapist and me sitting there in the room afterwards, followed by a polygraph to make sure that everything I told was truthful, which I passed. You right. know polygraph? I'm one for one on polygraphs, my friend. Oh, for two. <laughs> 
They gave me a second chance, and I also <laughs> failed that one. What did you fail on? This is a whole other story, but we don't need to get into it right now. I know what I failed on. I failed on the question around drugs. And at that point in my life, I had done no drugs, including marijuana, other than one cycle of steroids in college. Did you like inject or did you swallow? Yeah. So I had hurt my back playing baseball and I was get, I was looking to go back to play baseball. And a friend, a guy on the team, gave me an injectable steroid. Where did he inject it? Put it in my butt. Which is awful. I don't like needles to begin with. Yeah. yeah. I would like, I remember sweating in the bathroom, looking yeah. in the mirror and like taking this needle and I'm, I'm kind of imaging this for Dominic right now yeah. and getting ready to jam this needle right in my butt. So self administered. Self administered. Yeah. Okay. yeah. I would get the full wind up and then like, ee, right before I got it, got to the skin, I would stop. So you can't see Brian right now, but he had, he had like, he put his, he wound up. So his hand is like above his head. Right. It's like, do you really need that much momentum to jam this like, thing? It was, I mean, this was like, a, it would be like an hour ordeal every single time. I was like, this is not worth it. This is definitely not worth it. And I failed the polygraph 10 years later, so it clearly wasn't worth it. And that's why you never ended up in the FBI. And that's why I'm not in the FBI. Failure, I still haven't gotten over, and I don't know if I'll ever get over this. High school football against Fairlawn, late in the season, this was the game that was going to determine whether or not we made the playoffs. And I was assigned to cover their number one receiver who I'm five foot 10, 150 pounds. This dude was like six foot two. Uh, no, he was like six foot three, 185 pounds and fast as lightning. And I was one-on-one -on -one coverage with this guy all day. He ate me the fuck up. Like all he, game. All game long. He ate me the fuck up. We had a miraculous comeback. Scored an 80-yard touchdown with like a minute and a half left. The crowd was going nuts. We went up by like three points. We kick it off to them, stop them at their 15-yard line. First play, I'm lined up against this guy. He does a slant route over the middle. I get picked by two of their players. He catches the slant route, goes 85 fucking yards for the touchdown. We lose the game. I can see this is still hurting you right now. I have nightmares about this shit. I do not know if I'll ever get over that. Do you still have nightmares about it? I, I still do still have do. nightmares about it. Yeah. yeah, like it's not resolved. Yeah, yeah. There's probably some deep therapy waiting, waiting <laughs> to get that taken care of. All right, buddy. Your secret male grooming habit is? It drives me crazy when I see nose hairs or ear hairs. Mm. And so I've got this little Same. device that goes up in my nose and it's like... I got one of those razor. too. Yeah. If I go more than like five days without it, I'm like, mm, nope, I don't like it. Yeah, they'll be peeking out. So Dominic, if you ever see me with any extra nose hair or ear hair, please let me know. I'll let you borrow mine. Yeah. <laughs> wow, that's really, that's friendship. <laughs> that is friendship. This is not a secret grooming habit. I've, I've shaved my balls for years. You, you have to do it. It's the compassionate thing to do. So what I will share with you that is a secret, and this is a little bit embarrassing, is I get my eyebrows threaded. Wow, that is a secret. This is something that you don't know. Because I think it, it's taken wow. us this long to get to something that like we both don't know about huh. each other. My friend, Grace Gold, who's in the beauty industry, who writes about beauty products and like moisturizers and eye creams and all this stuff, 15 years ago, took me to get my eyebrows threaded. Wait, so explain this. Like what, what it is. I, I shave my eyebrows, but what, what does threading do? Threading, I mean, your eyebrows look great, but... Well, thank you, my friend. Yeah. yeah. So first of all, I wouldn't if, say if, they look like unbelievably amazing. That's but, the point. But they look good. That's the point. It's just to, to look good enough for you not to notice them. Hmm. It's like plucking your eyebrows, but apparently better for you so you don't get ingrown hairs. Does it hurt? Uh, yeah, it hurts. Huh. It's a bitch, actually. That sounds miserable. Yeah. yeah you, I've built up a tolerance for it. I sit down maybe like every two to three weeks. She has like a little string. Do you have a threader, like one person that does this for yes. you? Yes. No, no, no. I go in and whoever's available. Okay. Yeah, I do not have like a, it's not like an intimate relationship with my eyebrow threader. It's not that important. Hmm. But every two, three weeks I go in. When I look at people now and they have these like wayward hairs in their eyebrows or they have eyebrows coming out of all different places on their face, like I can notice it now. Women notice this shit. Do they ask they're you, like, like do you, did you get threaded? No, they don't say that. They're like, wow, you got, like, your eyebrows look really, You're really put together. nice. They don't That's, know. If you're wondering why Dom was put together, this is the reason. Let's Eyebrow get, threading. Let's move on. Let's, well, I have one more question on the male grooming thing. It's something I've been contemplating yeah. lately. So you said you, the first thing you said is that you, you shave your balls. Mm -hmm. Do you use a razor? Do you use electric? How do you do that? I use a razor. So I take one of those, like, Mach 3 razors into the shower, hmm. lube it up, 
Like I'll use some like shampoo or conditioner or whatever body wash, lube it up, and I am very gentle. Fair, okay. Stretch out the balls. Wow. Yes. Being a one nut guy, I feel like it's very risky. I'm not sure if I'm <laughs> ready to do that. I'm also wondering. Wait, so you have un you have hairy balls? I do uh, an electric. Okay. I don't get too close but i am interested in having a sack that is is hair free shorn do they have brazilians for guys is that a thing i think they do but i don't know if it's for your balls i think it's for your ass that's ass only ass uh, yeah it it seems like that yeah i'm glad you brought this up because we do need to have a responsible conversation about this i was once talking about this at work 10 years ago and there was a 50 year old guy who was like, oh my God, I never thought about shaving my, my balls before. I'm like, it's the compassionate thing to do if you have a partner and she yeah, wants for to everybody involved. He comes in the next day. He's like, dude, he's like, I was a bloody fucking mess. <laughs> he's like, I cut myself to pieces. Yeah. And I'm like, what did you do? And he, he was like, he tried to shave himself dry and he used one of those cheap ass, like one blade razors. Yeah, that's on him. That's I'm like, like brother. Completely, completely on him. Yeah, 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 yeah. You don't shave your face without. Thank you. Up. I you mean, need to get warm. Yeah. Yeah. Put a little bit of like lube or cream, whatever on there and take care Adding of this to the strange things you do in your shower. Okay. <laughs> All right, man. Ah, the one area that you are still old school. I would love for this not to be the case. And I've tried every other alternative, but reading, I still love a book. Huh. I feel like I'm like so technology digital guy. Yeah. But a Kindle, like even reading on my phone, I do it. Yep. I just don't enjoy it. I can't take the notes I want to do. I've looked at different apps that I could use to do it in different ways. I bought an iPad Pro so I could write with the pencil, mm. like in the margins, not the same. Yep. So old school, I still like to read the hard paper book. Same exact fucking answer. Really? For the same reasons. Huh. Yep. <laughs> Let's move <Done>. on. <laughs> the favorite pet that you've ever had. Oh, this is a great one. This is one of my favorite questions. Because I had a pet alligator. This I did not know about you. Yes. So in high school, I played on a travel baseball team. And I was the younger catcher. There was a, a, a more senior guy than I was. He was the starter. I was the backup. Okay. And this guy was just an asshole to me at all times. <laughs> I grew up around a lot of animals. A lot of pets. A lot of animals by the forest. So I loved animals. You had a lot of pets. Like what kind? Oh, goodness. I dogs, had, cats. Oh, mice. of course I had dogs, cats. I had all kinds of exotic lizards. I have, of course, an alligator. I had a ferret. I had a sugar glider. Holy shit. We had what's, guinea wait, pigs. Wait, what's the thing after ferret? A sugar glider. A sugar it glider? It looks like a little flying squirrel. Okay. You it's keep a, them in the house, like in a cage? or Yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, I had crawdads. I had fish. I had um, turtles. I had... Bird, I had, I had a lot of, a lot of wow, pets. man. Like yeah. I had no idea. Yeah, you were like Ace Ventura pet. Detective. I was Ace Ventura, which we'll get into on another question here in a moment. Ah, but nice. I was yeah. I found a lot of power in like having pets and being like yeah. cool with the animals. And so we were down in New Orleans for a baseball tournament yeah. over the summer, and the catcher, I knew he was terrified of bugs, especially big bugs. And so imagine, you know, those minivans back in the day that they had the window that just popped open from the bottom. Like yeah, it didn't yeah, roll yeah, down. Yeah, yeah, right? we it had just vented. It just yeah, vented. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we went on this alligator tour in the water, in the swamp, and it was a lot of fun. I saw these alligators. Like he was terrified of the alligators. I'm loving the alligators. <laughs> Afterwards, we all pile into the van. Now I'm still outside the van. He's inside. I look down and I see this giant black and yellow grasshopper. Okay. So I grab this thing and I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna do this. <laughs> So he was sitting right by the window. I stuck my hand up in the van, popped the grasshopper in there. Next thing I hear about five seconds later is screaming. The door piles over or falls open. He comes falling out. And he looks at me like he's, he's like, afraid of the grasshopper. He's, like, he's afraid of the grasshopper. He's like, I'm going to kill you. And he was big. <laughs> Luckily, I was faster. <laughs> so I found a lot of power in this alligator experience and animals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went back home like, I want to pet alligator. <laughs> And so I found this illegal reptile swap that sells because re- alligators, as you might imagine, are not legal. Yeah, pets. sure, sure. My parents were gracious enough to allow me to have an alligator for a while. Mr. and Mrs. Stacy allowed an alligator in their home. How big did this thing get? Well, my plan was to grow this to full size and have a little lagoon in my parents' basement. <laughs> so I had it for about two years and it was maybe two and a half feet. And I had it in a giant tank in my okay. room. And my freshman year of college, I came back for the holidays or uh, it was actually one of my first trips back. And 
my alligator was gone. My turtles yeah, were gone. Yeah, everything yeah, was gone. Yeah. So what happened? They're like, we called the zoo and got rid of all of it. <laughs> <laughs> what does t- I was I was mortified. I, I got to respect that power move yeah. by the Stacys. Okay. My favorite pet that I ever had was my pug growing up, Jespa. Hmm. And Jespa was a blind pug. So I, apparently she had cataracts, like from as early as I could remember, right? It's like So this was kind of like the animal that I just, I remember being there when I first can recall my own memories, right? Like five years old. And she, she lived for like 12 or 13 years and she had no eyesight, but her sense of smell could like guide her everywhere. And she was like a little tiny trash compactor. She would eat everything. I was a picky eater as a kid. I would sit at the kitchen table and I wasn't allowed to get up until I finished my fucking food. And every once in a while, I would just like drop some shit down there. Jess, when I worked as a team, yeah. you know, she would eat the things that I savior, couldn't handle. Food savior. Totally. And it was like all the evidence was gone. We were like really good friends. And, uh, and yeah, we had to, every time I see a pug walking around New York City, like instantly I think of Jespa. And, and, and you, have, you have good memories of Jespa. Loved Jespa. Now, do you think pugs are cute? I do. I think pugs are adorable. Really? Yeah. I feel like it's really one of these binary. Totally. I, yeah. I can see why you would think they're ugly, but because of Jespa, like right. every pug is adorable to me. Hmm. I follow pug accounts on Instagram for you that would. reason. I, I would. Yeah, I do. And I do. All right, man. Something unexpected that has changed in you over the last few years is. This is uh, a lot of what we talk about on this podcast, but my belief around emotions. Mm. Right. At the very least, I, I felt like emotions were something to be ignored and were weak. And now I look at them as important information to decision making. Yeah, essential. <laughs> essential. Uh, and a lot of power in them. That's changed my life drastically. So that that's just that's the first thing that popped in my head. Yeah. For me, I would agree with that too. No question. Um, for me, what I put down was solitude. Like I'm really enjoying spending time on my own. And the di- someone made this distinction for me once. The difference between loneliness and solitude, in both of those cases, you're alone. But solitude is having a sense of peace, being alone. And in the past, like I was never able to be alone without, let's say, communication with the outside world, like texting people or watching TV or reading books or something to distract myself from being alone. And I just got back from that trip in Colorado where I rented a cottage in the Rocky Mountains for six days, no Wi-Fi, no cell service. And for a number of those days, like it was just, I didn't have any external stimulation whatsoever. And I fucking loved it because it helps. It just helps me to get clear on what my purpose is, what work I'm doing. It helps me to reset. It helps me to actually understand where I'm escaping and numbing. And then from there, like I can reorganize my life in a way that works for me. I was working with my coach, John O'Connor recently, and we were going through an exercise. Great, yeah. Great guy. And he asked me to think about the most peaceful, blissful experience. And then after I thought about it for a moment, he's like, well, where are you? What is that? Yeah. It was just being alone in meditation, completely like there in that moment. Mm. I would have never even imagined that a few years back. Yeah. But that solitude piece of being disconnected and just being in space, gosh, what a powerful, peaceful place to be. John Wineland, who you've heard me talk about ad nauseum on this podcast before, and he's a coach of mine right now around masculinity and spiritual intimacy and tantric practices. And he says that one of the things that the masculine craves the most is freedom. All the things that we're doing in some respects is after freedom, right? So I'm trying to make as much money as I can make so I can have financial freedom. I'm trying to achieve as much as I can achieve so I can have freedom from this nagging voice telling me I'm not meeting my potential. Oftentimes, like that freedom that we're talking about can be achieved by cultivating solitude. And most guys like don't know how to do that. So we run around and create a lot more bullshit for ourselves when in actuality, it's exacerbating the problem versus learning how to cultivate pieces of time where you could just be with yourself. And I used to avoid that, actively avoid Same. that. If I was on a plane for four or five hours, I had to make sure my phone or my Game Boy or whatever was fully Game charged Boy, yeah. that I had two or right? I had two or three books with me because my biggest fear that I had, was unrecognized was one of sitting in that chair alone, bored out of my mind. That was my hell. Yeah. Bored out of your mind or also like I could be using this time to be more productive. All these things I have sure. to get done. Why aren't you doing this? What about that? It's like, it's escaping go, go, from go, your go, voice. Go. Yeah. 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 
That question was semi-useful. We provided, we provided some, <laughs> some level nutritional of value. Value it's yeah. going straight downhill yeah. from here. Great. Something in your high school locker was. You go first on this one. Okay. In my hallway locker, I had this collection of gum. So every day I would chew a piece of gum. At the end of the day, when all the flavor was gone, I would stick it in the locker. And by the end of the year, I had this like fucking. The entire locker was covered in a rainbow of chewed gum. It's disgusting. It's disgusting. I took pride in that. Did and you, when you left high school or left that locker, did you clean it out? I or? did. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't leave it there for the, whoever it was, but there was definitely like stuff caked on it. I, I had to use one of those uh, scrapers to get Ugh. it off. And in my football locker, which was downstairs, I had Playboy centerfolds. I could still see the picture. I feel like that's, that's classic. That's pre-internet. Holly Witt was her name. Can Wit. you picture her right now? I, 100%. Wow. Seared into my memory. Wow. I was thinking, as you're answering, I was thinking about this one, and all I can see in my locker are books, my jacket, and some food. And food. In my remembering, like, like an apple or something like huh. that. Like in, in, in my remembering mind, it all looks very organized. Okay. In reality, I don't think it really was. Yeah. But since you brought up gum, I do remember the top part of my locker having all kinds of packs of gum. Now, my gum was unchewed. <laughs> it had, had wrapping on it. It was ready to be chewed. <laughs> Uh, so a bit different than yours, but that's probably what I remember the most. Okay. I was hoping for something more out of your locker, but you were pretty tame. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Technologically, you are challenged when it comes to? Well, you would probably say setting up this podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Like behind the scenes, it's taken us what, like four or five months for Brian to come in and get the, uh, the mics up, the sound yeah. check going within like. 10 minutes. This yeah. AV, this AV <laughs> system thing is all new to me. Uh, gosh. I, okay. Here, here's what it is. It's something I'd like to be better at too. But social media, whether it's Instagram or Facebook, I would love to be posting more content. Yeah. But it's just such a pain in the ass to interrupt whatever I'm doing in the moment. Yeah, I get that. To do that. And yeah. it feels like it takes away. Like so to bring out, to bring out the camera, out. bring out the video, yeah. be like, hey, let's have a moment and like yes. to constantly be on the lookout for that moment. And yes, exactly. I so I think, it. I think that's, that's it for me. For me, I'm technologically challenged when it comes to typing. You I'm a type. I'm a two finger typer. Get out of here. For my entire life, a two finger typer. I never learned how to type. Are you looking to change that? Not at all. Okay. Yeah. Because <laughs> like, the amount of content that you write, which is extensive, is yeah. shocking that you can do with two fingers. I wrote a book. Wow. Using two fingers. Wow. Yeah, I'm pretty fast. And like most people don't even recognize it because they hear how fast I'm typing until mm -hmm. they actually look. You know, that's, that's the equivalent. Like before we had a bunch of like typewriters and computers, you see the person that grabbed the pencil like with their entire fist yeah, instead yeah. of elegantly putting it between the two index fingers, finger, yeah. middle finger, and thumb. You're that guy. You're like the caveman of, of computers. Uh, like not too long ago. And when I say not too long ago, it was maybe like 10 years ago. I used to hold my fork that same way. Goodness. Like with, with a fist a versus Neanderthal, like, the, really. Was, yeah, it couldn't take me anywhere, man. Here's really, um, probably one of the most perspective expanding questions that we have on this list. Have you ever pooped yourself? Yes or no. And if no, were you ever close? I have, I don't know if I have a great story about it though. You have pooped yourself or almost? Yeah, I remember, I remember like being like, a, a, I don't know, stomach flu or what it was, but <laughs> having a fart and be like, wait a second, and then running into the bathroom quickly and having to Where were you? rinse my boxers out. <laughs> were you at school? Uh, this was last week in my apartment. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was probably, I, 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 I imagine it was, no, this, I feel like this is within the last five years. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So you were at your apartment, you were by yourself. Yes. Got it. Yes. Okay. Actually, ah, I remember now. I was walking home and I wasn't feeling good. Same experience I just mentioned, yeah. but I wasn't home yet. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, like, is this going to seep? Oh yeah. And Ooh. I wasn't sure. I wasn't, I wasn't totally sure. Like, did I poop? It was, it was a question. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not positive I didn't. I'm not positive I did. And then I had to go to the bathroom once I got home after a 10 minute walk and just wonder, like, is my ask to be covered in poop or am i worried for no reason it's such a helpless feeling oh yeah it was awful okay my closest run but the, and the reason why we asked this question is because like every guy has a i pooped myself story or i came close to 
my closest run in with this, I think it was maybe I was 26 years old. I was living in Hoboken, New Jersey. I had two roommates. And I think I, it was like a Saturday afternoon, big night of partying. I woke up from a nap. And for whatever reason, I was wearing like running shorts and like a t shirt. It was summer. I had no underwear on. I don't know why. Like, I very rarely have no underwear on. And I go to CVS to buy mixers for the night because we're having people over. So I have like, I'm online at CVS. It's like 15 people deep. I've got two liter bottles of Coca-Cola. And you know that moment where like it comes screaming? Yes. From and, from totally fine from to nowhere. just your yeah. asshole's the tightest it's ever been. Yeah. And it, it was like, I don't know how to explain it to you, but it was almost like if you can picture like a big gust of wind coming from behind you, the way that it kind of like makes your body go back. Like, I, I don't know if you need to explain it. I think, I think we got this one. Got it? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was like, what? I tightened up and I barely, barely kept it. And I remember standing there going like, holy shit, like I can't stay online anymore. So I, I like, I gingerly put down the two bottles of Coca-Cola. I waddled <laughs> out of the CVS. Now, we lived maybe, maybe. Oh, you didn't, you didn't go to the bathroom in the CVS? No, no, no. It didn't oh. even occur to me. Wow. You were in panic mode. Panic mode. Like, like face is crimson red. Uh, like my body is tense and like the sweat comes. Can you, you smell it at this point? Smell it? Yeah. No. Have you not pooped your pants yet? No, I haven't pooped my pants. Okay. Like, this is just the, the whoosh that this happened. Is the, yeah, 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 yeah. And okay. I'm like, and, and it, it was, it was one of these like situations where I couldn't take normal steps. If I took a normal step and I lived about a quarter mile from home, all quarter hell mile. Goodness. Yes, this was this was far. The dude, it took me a half an hour to waddle, to waddle home, and I got to the staircase, like the final staircase to go up to the apartment. And I didn't know if I was going to make it. I got up, got into the bathroom, and dumb and dumbered everywhere. This is a story of not pooping yourself, Dom. Uh, but I said, have you ever pooped <laughs> yourself, or were you ever close? <laughs> yes, I almost. Oh, by the way, and and when this happened, when I got into the apartment, my friend's girlfriend was like in the living room mm -hmm. and she's like, hey, Dom. And I went right into the bathroom. Nope, got to go. And you know that scene in Dumb and Dumber? Yes, like, of course. I mean, you could hear everything from the outside. So that was. Did you have a moment when you're walking home? Because sometimes I've had that feeling before where it's like, Ugh! but then it goes away after a little while. And then it comes this, back and yeah. goes away and comes back. There was no receding. It oh, was, it was like, it was, it was, it was like 30 minutes of pure torture and like. I actually stopped. I remember stopping behind City Hall in Hoboken and being like, am I going to have to shit behind City Hall? Mm. Actually, like a 50-50 until, <laughs> until I was like, you can do this. <laughs> okay. Really conjured up that energy. The movie you grew up loving. Oh, Ace Ventura, for sure. So, so good. Yeah, Pet Detective. I still use like some of the quotes from that, right? Like, all righty then. Of course. Like a glove. Yes. I feel like every time I search for a GIF, Ace Ventura pops up. I'm like, as well, it should. Every time you search for a gift? A GIF. A GIF. Oh, like a GIF. Um, yeah. Got it, got it, yeah. got it, got it. Well, yeah. good, good call, Aguado. For me, <laughs> Breakfast Club. I've never even seen it. You haven't seen Breakfast Club? No. Okay, I could probably recite 70% of the movie to you please, right now. Please don't, though, I don't because I'm not going to get any of it. You're not, you're sure? You're not interested? Yep. Nope. Okay. But I will tell you, the amazing thing about Breakfast Club is it was like filmed in 72 hours. I think it was filmed over the course of three days at Shermer High School in Shermer, Illinois, which is not too far from hmm. where you grew up. And there's like seven people in the entire movie. It's, it's fantastic. Okay. I'm going to have to check it out. The longest you've gone without showering is? There was probably a moment at, when I was camping that was maybe a few days. Yeah. But what I find more interesting are the days that I'm working from home here in New York. <laughs> yeah. And I'll go like an entire day, like, oh, I haven't showered. Yeah. Like, well, I'll shower tomorrow. And then I work another whole day at home and I haven't showered. Has that happened? That's, so I've gone at least 48 hours just here in New York working. Put this into perspective. So you would wake up on like a Tuesday morning, not shower that whole day. Right. Wake up on a Wednesday, not shower that whole day. That's right. Thursday, Thursday morning, I'm like, whoa, woof. That actually may be longer than 48 hours because if you, if you track it back, True. your shower, your last shower would have been on a Monday, mm -hmm. all day Tuesday, all day Wednesday. That's, all, that's 48 hours right there. It, could, it, could, it probably could be longer than 48. And you got to count the sleep from yeah. Wednesday night to Thursday morning. Count I, the sleep I know you're Monday. like an eight shower a guy day. That's so the this, thing. This is probably like awful for you. For, for me, yeah, I'm, I'm actually cringing. Like I don't know if I've gone more than 24 hours without a shower because like some days I will shower three times a day. It's one of my things. Do you get stinky quick? I don't. There's something about it that I like feeling clean, but it also kind of like rinses off where I just was. Well, plus between your cold showers and shaving your balls and doing <laughs> breath work, like there's a lot in between threading your eyebrows. I'm sure you shampoo your eyebrows. There's a lot, there's a lot to do in there. Okay. 
All right. The woman who's had the biggest influence on you not named your mom or your sister. Oh, wow. There's, there is so many. Like my, where my head immediately goes is to some of the bosses that I've had at Accenture. Melanie LaBusque and Dana Oliver are two that were great. If I had to name one, I, I, I go to my grandma. And I don't know if that counts because grandma, the mom. name mom is in there. My grandma, my granddad, you've heard me talk about him before. He's a pastor of an Assembly of God church. And my grandma was like the rock of that family. Mm. And uh, she taught me, uh, she taught me love, man. She taught me uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, what the unconditional part of what love really is. Hmm. How'd she do that? By just being. Like she let me like lay on her lap and like and rub my hair and tell me stories and it always felt really safe when grandma and grandpa were coming over to the house. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, that's cool, man. I didn't I, think I, I didn't really have that relationship with my grandparents. Most of my grandparents were were gone by the time like I grew up, you know. So I only had like one real grandparent relationship. My father's mother and she lived. She was in her nineties, but I didn't have that kind of relationship with her. She was great. She cooked us food. But I didn't have a closeness to her that I would have liked, like that you just described. So I feel that. For me, the woman who's had the biggest influence on me that's not named my mom or my sister Mary is Grace Gold. I was going to be really upset if it wasn't Grace Gold. You know, yeah. You've but like, there's nobody that you've talked about more when it comes to personal development than Grace Gold. Also a great name. Yeah, it is. So she and I first started like our relationship was dating way back in the day. I think I was like maybe 23 or 24 years old and we started dating. And I was a very different guy back then. Like I was the guy who... All I did was watch sports and drink, and that was my life. And she didn't drink at all, hated sports, would sometimes stay in like Friday, Saturday nights to do work, like when she was in college. Like she just, she and I couldn't have been more different. From that, the beginning of that relationship, she introduced me to global perspectives, to books. She was the one who introduced me to The Way of the Superior Man by David Data and The Four Hour Work Week by Tim Ferriss and to personal development with the Landmark Forum. She was the first diverse woman that I ever dated. She's half Indian and half Jewish. And so like gave me access to a different kind of culture. And I realized like how small my world was and she opened it up to me and she created a fucking monster and I'm forever grateful for her. Grace Gold. She also loved the Jersey Shore. (laughs) What do you mean? On our anger podcast, you told that story where you went off on that guy as you're going down to the Jersey Shore. Oh yeah. you're, You're all angry. Yes, when we came back from the Jersey, and our, her car broke down, and there was this guy in the BMW behind us who was beeping us, and he just wouldn't go around. Right. And I jumped out right. of the car, and I wanted to fight the him. Police officer said, "Surfer dude, surfer, surfer dude." Yeah, because I was wearing just my bathing suit and no shirt. <laughs> <laughs> For more context on that one, check out the podcast on anger. On anger, yeah. <laughs> Your guilty food pleasure is... Oh, this is so easy for me. It's I know it. cookies. <laughs> <laughs> I love cookies. I love, I, just, I don't know what, what it is about cookies. My, my grandmothers both used to make cookies. My dad loved cookies. It's, a gen- it's really a genetic thing. You're on your deathbed. Yeah. You get one cookie. And I hate to even admit this, a sugar cookie with icing and sprinkles. There's no shame in that. From like an Italian bakery or something? No, it's got to be soft. I don't know if it's an Italian bakery or not. Okay. Who's making this? Then? Um, can grandma make it? Grandma could make it for grandma sure. Grandma could do it? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. There's no shame in that, man. Great. Appreciate that. Actually, you know what? My mom, that's who I would want making Mrs. that. Mrs. Stacy. She makes these Shout pretty, out. pretty killer cookies with icing. Yeah. That's, okay. that's, 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 that's why I'm going. Now, this isn't to exclude a chewy chocolate chip cookie or a peanut butter cookie or oatmeal raisin, which some people find disgusting, but See, I'm cool with. Like, I'm good with all of them. Okay. I, you had me until oatmeal raisin. Right. Oatmeal ra- I mean, so oatmeal does not make a cookie. And, what about and oatmeal raisin. chocolate chip? The chocolate chip can save the oatmeal cookie. Got it. But, but it's like in spite of the oatmeal. Feel you. Do so you know okay. what I'm saying? Just like, give me a regular cookie, throw some Would you chips. rather have some sort of nut? No, no nuts. No nuts either. No nuts. Fair. Nuts are like a healthy Agreed. snack. Church and side. state. Church and state. Like right. if I if I'm gonna do this, like give me like double fudge chocolate chip cookies. Do you ever go to Ben's cookies over here by your apartment? I do. Yeah. Those are spot. fucking amazing. Yeah. Okay. For me, my guilty food pleasure, cereal. I so I like what kind? What did you go with? All kinds. All the sugar cereals. So like Lucky Charms, up, huh? Lucky Charms. No, I, the, the, I don't like the ones that have the marshmallows in them. Okay. Growing up. 
My parents were strict about no sugar cereal. So it was always like cornflakes, Rice Krispies, Cheerios. Right. Total. Gross. Total. Remember total. that shit? How about Kix? Kix was that interesting in between. Kix was like as close. Kix and Raisin Bran with like the frosted raisins were as close like to How sugar. delusional do we have to be to like think that that stuff was actually pretty good for us? I know. Now I know. You oh, look at it. It's like cheesy. Awful. All of it. But when I got old enough to move out and live in my own place, I would have 15 boxes of different <laughs> cereals. Like you're talking about Cinnamon Toast Crunch and Alphabet and Reese's Pieces cereal wow. and Apple Jacks and Frosted Flakes. And like I could keep going. And I have about four or five different boxes of cereal right now. Right now. What, yeah. what are the four you have right now? I have Frosted Flakes. I have Cinnamon Toast Crunch. And I have these two boxes of... Uh, they're like super healthy cereals that, that, that like don't have sugar in them. They're called Catalina Crunch. They're like ten dollars a fucking bag. Okay. I scratch the itch when I need it without the. Gift. I, I got to give a shout out because one, a cereal that I ate for years and has now become a, a bit of a legend was. Have you ever had Puffin cereal? Peanut butter Puffins. It's made by Barber's Bakery. Yeah, they're good. And if you save the UPC labels, you enough of them, you can adopt a puffin. What what it, what, it, what is a puffin? You know, well, a puffin's a bird. Oh, it's a bird. That, I just that, thought it was the name of the cereal. That bird that's on the cereal is a puffin. That's where the name comes from. Yeah, completely. Missed so I, I first I started with the cereal. I became because you read. I, I used to read. You read the boxes as you eat the cereal. Never. Never. Okay. So I was. <laughs> I would. I would drain the box both as eating it okay. and reading it. Okay. And I learned all about puffins. The bird. What, what do I need to know about the puffin? You don't need to know. They're very cute. You don't need to know anything else <laughs> other than there's a place where they're a bit endangered. Okay. And so Barbara Bakery, who does puffin cereal, if you collect enough UPC labels, you can adopt a puffin. Now, it was like 300 UPCs. It would take me My a God. long time to get to 300. But the idea was like a class. Like a classroom would order a bunch of puffin oh, cereal. Yeah. The kids would collect them and they could like learn about puffins and adopt puffins. I thought this was a great idea. So I ate a lot of puffins and decided to save over a period of five years all my UPC labels. And so I got to 300. Are you kidding me? That's a lot of fucking cereal, dude. Then they changed the program. <laughs> and you no longer needed 300 to, to adopt a puffin. You only needed 20. Oh, my gosh. Do you have like an entire like a whole ap flock. apiary? A whole apiary of puffins <laughs> adopted. Yes. That's amazing. So that's my cereal story. That's good shit, man. All right. I appreciate yeah. that. What was your biggest hobby growing up as a kid? The expectation for me was to play sports. And I spent a lot of time playing sports, Same. specifically baseball and, and basketball mostly. But my hobby, the thing I would do after that, I would basically get through the sports in order to do this thing was to go to the forest and build my fort. Oh, you had a fort. And I had Hell two yeah. friends that had one, one is now an architect that would go and do this with me. And it was so much. I loved it. I loved building. I loved creating. I loved, I loved that whole aspect. So you have legitimate, you have legitimate skills. Like you've built stuff for your home. I've seen you build bookshelves. You've built like a desk that's like badass. So I imagine this fort wasn't just your run of the mill sticks oh, and twigs. No, 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 no. We would, we would go source wood from either other forts or homes or whatever. It was a duplex. You had two story. We had a, a rope swing. We had that's where we kept our porn. Uh, Hell yeah, yeah, it's great. Fuck, good move by you, man. My biggest hobby growing up: baseball cards, baseball Ooh, cards, good one. football cards. Basketball that was currency cards. back in the day. Was, yeah, total currency, and I was maniacal with that shit. Right, I was like collecting complete sets. I was making trades. Now, how did you collect the sets? Did you buy the sets themselves, Fuck or did you that, put it dude. together by based on buying the packs? Buying a complete set. You are a fraud. I totally agree with you. Yeah. yeah. Like you, you got to put in the work. So you got to buy boxes of cards. You got to get like triples and, you know, quadruples of, of common guys so you can put that set together. There's nothing more rewarding than cracking open a pack and finding that like final card that completes the entire 1992 set of Donruss baseball cards. What year did you start collecting cards? I was born in 78. I believe like 84. 485. I, I can picture what the top's 84 look Same. Card looks like. A little square down at the bottom with the portrait and then the action shot. Same. Yeah, I couldn't move past this without having to tell the story about how I completely ripped off my best friend from childhood, Michael DeCourcy, who had the Don Mattingly rookie card. Ooh. Don Mattingly rookie, which I still have today. 
I traded him five Mets cards, like Rusty Staub and Wally Backman, like just guys for the Don Mattingly rookie card. And it was the greatest heist of all time. Wow. Yeah. I mean, he's a disgrace to humanity for doing did that. You, did you, were you a Beckett subscriber? Beckett all yeah, the time. Right. And Beckett, if you don't know what that is, that, that would give all the values. estimated values or pricing of each of these cards. Yeah. It was kind of like, you know, like stock market currency. And I could memorize, I was maniacal. Like there, I used to have this memory where I could tell you the exact value of every card and how much it went up or down from the month before. If I said Billy Ripken, what would you say? <laughs> I would say Cal Ripken's brother. <laughs> He was also the guy that it was. It was a very famous card because he had a. I think I forget what year. Oh yeah, the um the mirror card on one side. He was holding the. He looked like he was righty, and then on the other card, it looked like he was lefty. Nope, that, that was a different. I, I don't know who that was, but this one was. He was holding a wood baseball bat, and on the bottom of the bat it said "fuck." Oh no, I never knew that. And so there was one version of the card that said that. And then there was another version of the card where they blacked it out. Huh. And then there was a third version of the card that they just, they wiped it out all together. Fascinating. And the one that said fuck on it was worth like $1,000. Wow. And then the one that with the blackout was worth 15 And then the regular Billy Ripken card was worth five cents. <laughs> someone, yeah, you had to pay someone else to take that card right, off your hand. Right. I actually just bought a pack of cards the other day, baseball cards. Oh, okay. What do they look like these days? It was amazing. Um, they're like what was it like four bucks for a pack? It was, okay. it was it's not terrible, not terrible, but I, I ended up doing really well, man. I got like Aaron judge. I got Vladimir Guerrero jr. I got Mike trout and wow. Cody Bellinger. It was like an all-star pack. Are they worth anything? I don't know. Like, cause, cause Beckett, you have to go and get a subscription for right now. So there is a app by tops, which is one of the, the top baseball card manufacturers. Yeah. And for maybe five years ago, I got into it for about a year or two. Did you? And you literally, you can buy packs of cards that are digital. You can trade them with all but some people. There's a whole social aspect to it. Interesting. Yeah. So digital cards would be kind of like a Kindle book for me. Like I wouldn't be interested. I, right. I need a, an right. old school card in my hand. Fair enough. What is the most embarrassing song that you rock out to? Anything Katy Perry. <laughs> Anything Katy Perry. Yeah. Truly. <laughs> And I usually think when I'm dancing, now dancing, one of my biggest fears in life, but I usually think about Left Shark while Left Shark is dancing. If you remember from the Super Bowl a few years back where they had Left Shark and he was just completely offbeat. I do not remember that. Oh, it's a whole, look it up, Google it. Okay. Um, but I think of uh, Carrie, Katy Perry, anything she's got. I didn't even think about that, but I definitely have, I think, Roar on one of my playlists completely somewhere. Completely Roar, yes. I, for me, I think it's anything by Imagine Dragons. Oh, those, those are great. What's embarrassing about that? I thought they were kind of like the the new Nickelback. Hmm. That's what people have been telling me. It's kind of like, ah, you like Imagine Dragons? That's kind of like Nickelback reincarnated. I barely know the I'm not very good with music. I enjoy it if somebody puts it on. I don't really know what to go choose. Yeah. I would like to know more, but I barely even know the Nickelback story. The Nickelback story is basically like everyone says that they suck and no one knows why they suck. It's just like there's this consensus that somewhere... Along the way, everyone was like, if you like Nickelback, then you're, you're not really a music fan. Oh, okay. And even Nickelback makes the joke. They're like, we get it. We suck, but we're famous and rich, so enjoy our music. And Do then you imagine, like Nickelback? Not really. You really hesitate. You know there. who loves Nickelback? Who? Art. Art would love Nickelback. Yeah, yeah Art huh. loves Nickelback. But uh, so Imagine Dragons, maybe... maybe I'm going to have to listen to Nickelback after this. I'm not sure what, what songs they even have. Okay. I, I want to judge for myself. You should. Yeah. The most embarrassing nickname you've ever had. I haven't had many nicknames, but the one that comes to mind is Big Bry. Big Bry. Big Bry. Yeah, it just seems very somewhere between dumb and douchey. <laughs> when was the last time you were called Big Bry? And who calls you this? I've got I've got one one of my buddies in Chicago calls me this. Hey Big Bry, how you doing? I'm like like still. We're, st we're still doing this. Okay. <laughs> For me, I'm not proud about this. Um the most embarrassing nickname I ever had was Angry Dom. Ooh. And these are like my best friends who would have this. So there, there was like this period of time right around college slash first few years graduating after college where I just was like not a happy guy. I was drunk when this part of me would come out. So like uh, I would suppress it normally, but then this like part of me would come out and I would antagonize. This is your would, alter ego. Yeah, it was this alter ego. Only my closest friends would see it and they would call me Angry Dom. It's definitely not something I'm proud of. And that angry Dom guy is like, it's, he's gone, he's dead, like that alter ego is. But, but I could definitely see 
that part of me way back in that era where it was like, in the course of my day, everything was good. I'm fine. I don't have anger. Just like we talked about in our anger, in our anger podcast. And then I would start drinking and then boom, the true colors would come out. Mm. It wasn't pretty. Take it easy. Angry Dom. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, to- I'm totally using Watch that. your step over there, pal. Otherwise you'll get angry Dom. As a kid, you once got in trouble for. Oh, geez. <laughs> we could, we could, <laughs> Where do we begin? We could, yeah. We could go for hours on this one. Um, sixth grade. I brought my Game Boy, which is like I had asked for for Christmas for a Game Boy. I got a Game Boy. I loved it. Like this is not the color Game Boy that, or the the, the D, DS Game Boy. This is the original black and white Game Boy. Oh yeah. I was playing it in class. Ooh, while the teacher was while teaching. the teacher was teaching. Teacher comes over, give it to me. Uh, okay, fine. I gave it to him. Like after class, I said, "Hey, got my Game Boy back." I said, "Tell your parents what you did. Have them come in and get the Game Boy." Mm. That was way, way too scary to do. Okay. So I just left the Game Boy. Back <laughs> so you never got the Game Boy back? For a year. <laughs> End of the school I year. I was way more terrified of my parents knowing that I was playing Game Boy in class than actually wanting my Game Boy back. I think that was a good move on your part. Nice calculation. We blew up a stick of di- a quarter stick of dynamite in the woods near our house. Where do you get a quarter stick of dynamite at? Kevin Cruz had it. Okay. Kevin Cruz, right? Kevin, Kevin was a guy, one of the kids in my class. I think we were maybe in like fifth grade. Is that the same thing as an M80? Yeah, my understanding is yes. Okay. And we just like dug out this hole in the woods. And of course, it was like not that far from our house. So that when we blew it up, our neighbor was walking through with a, their dog and saw us and promptly went home and told my parents and I got fucking busted. Busted. Yeah. Mm-hmm. When I was a kid, anytime I broke a rule... I got caught. There was never a time where I broke a rule and didn't get caught. I was just terrible at it. So I was just good. Good lesson for ethical adult Dom. (laughs) All right, man. We got two more questions left. One thing that you cannot live without. This is going to be not that exciting, but, but so true. And that is some of my tools to help process things I'm going through in life. So meditation is the first one that comes to me. And uh, running, working out, that one comes to me. And the reason I say I can't live without it is because I have gone recently up to three days without doing either of those things. And I start to get agitated and irritated. And and I'm like, wow, was that me all the time before? Yeah. Wild. Like a wild change of who I feel myself to be. And so those two tools for me are must-haves. I get you on that, man. For me, it's what I'm drinking right now. Bulletproof coffee Ooh. in the morning. If I don't have... Are we, are, we uh, are they advertising with us yet or no? No, no. I, I think we're, we're in contract uh, negotiations yeah, yeah. with them we soon. Have to, we have to mention them 50 more times and then, <laughs> then we'll... Yeah. Got it. And for those of you who don't know Bulletproof coffee, you need to get into this, man. So it's, good. It's basically high quality coffee uh, blended with... And you can pick at your poison here. So the way that I make my coffee in the morning is I put grass-fed ghee, which is like a clarified butter... I put their brain octane, which is a high dose of medium chain triglyceride fats that help to, you know, it's the highest quality MCT oil that helps your brain to activate, blended with collagen protein and whey protein. So that's like my breakfast. And you... I do the exact same thing, but no collagen protein. No protein. Yeah. So it's just the the ghee and the brain octane. Yes. Those of you that are thinking about this that are lactose intolerant, I, I don't do dairy, generally speaking. But the ghee does not have lactose in it. It's yeah. actually, it's clarified butter. And so the lactose is gone and I have zero problems with it. Yeah. That. And you blend it. It's be- it's like a, an amazing taste. And because like the fats are in it, you don't get that like jittery caffeine high. Yep. It comes on much more No slow. jitters and it satiates. So I don't get hungry until 2 or 3 p.m. usually. Oh, wow. That, that late? Yeah. The last food I ate yesterday was at about 6.30 p.m., which is very, that's actually, I usually eat a lot later than that. But yesterday was 6.30. I had the Bulletproof coffee this morning and I'm nowhere near hungry right now. Huh. And I probably won't be until one or two. Yeah, it, it is kind of amazing how long I got. I mean, like I, for me, it's noon and I need to eat something. But back in the day, like I was starving when I woke up. Mm-hmm. And now this is like really helped me to, and my workouts, I, when I work out in the morning before I've eaten, but when I've had like my Bulletproof coffee, I actually like set new records but if I've eaten already, my workouts tend to be like 10 to 15% less powerful. Wow. Less energizing too. Like my actual weights will go down, but also like my distance, my speed on the treadmill, like all that stuff will go down after I've eaten. Bulletproof coffee. Get yours today on Amazon or Whole Foods. <laughs> all right, man. Last question. 
one hope that you have for the future? For like the world or for me? What's, what's the context here? No context. Broad as you want to make it. My hope for me and the world, we'll do it that way, is that, that each individual really finds their path and purpose in life and what they're here for, what really excites them. Because I feel like with that, everything else falls in place. We start to create environments that are, that are amazing for us and other people, right? Man amongst men stuff. We find purpose and energy. A lot of stuff that we're talking about here, but I feel like that's my hope for, for myself and the world. I feel you, man. Mine is quite similar. And this is something that came to me out of the seven days in solitude that I spent in the Rocky Mountains. And I've shared this with you before. You're going to hear me talk about this a lot more over the coming weeks, months, years, decade, is my hope for the future is that we can get 10 million men to make a 10-year commitment to doing inner work on themselves. 10 fucking million men to make a 10-year commitment, not just like a I'm going to hire a coach for a 30, you know, whatever, or I go to a retreat and then that's it or read a book. I'm talking about like making a decade long commitment to building a practice around making yourself a better human being, right? To expand your perspective around what issues are important to women, right? To understand like what your sexual desires are and how that, like how that shaped your reality. Like if 10 million men were working together with one another in men's groups and had a daily practice, this world would change. Completely change. Completely change. And and like what you were saying about men finding their purpose too, people finding their purpose. If you're connected to that, you're happier. You're creating better environments for others. Like women feel better in your presence. So if my hope for the future is that like we can be at the ground floor of inspiring a movement like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think something I grew up with was a very like there's a right and there's a wrong. Mm. And there was never room for their it just is. Yeah. I it's that. happening whatever it is in front of me. And I feel like this work that you're talking about doing this in a work, I'm in year three of at least a 10 year journey, probably more like a lifelong journey. And I think that's one of the biggest things that's come to me is like, it doesn't always have to be right or wrong or this way or that way. Yeah. It can, it can just be unfold and learn from whatever it is. Yeah. Everyone's journey is very unique to them. So that's my hope for the future. We're border, we're bordering on value here. So <laughs> yeah, we've got to cut this down. one short. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so those are our 20 questions, man. I learned some shit about you. Yeah, you too. Yeah. Especially those eyebrows. <laughs> when you were making some of the, the facial movements over there, I really noticed your eyebrows bouncing up and down, especially the poop story. Yeah, they're, they're, they're quite, really moving there. Yeah. yeah, the poop story, they get animated. Well, as promised, hopefully you did not learn anything of substance or value in today's episode, but you did have some laughs. If you like those questions, you can download the list of 20 at doinnerwork.com forward slash 20 questions, doinnerwork.com forward slash 20 questions. 